Welcome to the Rappaport Center Human Rights Happy Hour. Um, this is what we used to call it, but now we call it a colloquium on health and human rights. Um, and I want to tell you that the, the people who are here for Professor Slade's class, um, Winslade, sorry, the speakers have generously agreed to allow a tape of the talk. So it's not as great as being here live, and this is exciting, and we're glad to have you all here. But I know some people are not able to get in who are still standing outside. So if that's the case and that makes a difference to you, is that all right? And even people who didn't come over, we won't let them see it, only the people who, <laughs> who made their way over. It's actually very impressive that you all made your way all the way over here. So come back for other things. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll have another one in two weeks. Um, so this is the penultimate lecture in our Health and Human Rights series um, that uh, we've had this semester, uh, co-sponsored by the Graduate School, um, the St. David Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention in Undeserved Populations at the School of Nursing, the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health, and the Dell Medical School. And so we're grateful to all of those co-sponsors and to many of you who have uh, been familiar faces throughout the series. Um, Today, uh, the talk is on bioethics and human rights. Can human rights survive the post-human? So hopefully you've been reading your science fiction in addition to your medical mm -hmm. ethics materials, um, and we'll be prepared for the talk by our special guest, George Annis, um, who is William Fairfield Warren, distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Health Law, bioethics and human rights at the Boston University School of Public Health. He's also a professor at the Boston University School of Medicine and the School of Law. Um, he has a law degree as well as a master's in public health. Um, George Annis is one of the leading thinkers in health and human rights. Um, he's the co-founder of Global Lawyers and Physicians, a transnational professional association of lawyers and physicians working together to promote human rights and health. He's also, um, and, and relatedly, a leading thinker in bioethics. Um, and he is the author or editor of 19 books on health law and bioethics, including a forthcoming book that uh, the students in the seminar have read, um, a chapter of called Genomic Messages. Um, and some of his more recent works are Worst Case Bioethics, Death, Disaster, and Public Law, American Bioethics, Crossing Human Rights and Health Law Boundaries, and the Rights of Patients. If I were to read his, his biography, we would be here for the whole time. So I'm not going to keep going except to say um, he's also very much grounded in practice um, and has held a variety of government regulatory posts um, in, in Massachusetts. Um, George Annis also has a long history of respectful debate, I understand it, with our second speaker, um, who will be a respondent on George's paper, um, John Robertson. John Robertson holds the Vincent and Elkins Chair here at the UT Law School. Um, he's also widely published and respected in the fields of bioethics um, and, and, and law. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, seeing their interaction. And I had a chance to get a peek of some slides. So you're even going to get to see some pictures of their interactions from long ago um, and relate them to today. So please join me in welcoming um, George Annis. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about the future. And it's always, I'm always, I was going to say it's always a mistake, but let's hope that's not true. Uh, a couple of people already asked me about this. What the hell is this thing uh, there? And that is a storm cloud. Okay, that's a storm cloud. Storm cloud over the future. This is not working. Let's do this. That's my favorite view of the future. And the questions are good ones, right? Where's our laser guns, our self driving cars, our food in a pill, our robot servants? Uh, the point is, nobody can predict the future. And when we try to predict the future, we're usually wrong. Uh, nonetheless, we have to deal with it. And as lawyers or people interested in uh, human rights, you want to think of ways, kind of sounds like a bizarre thing to do, uh, of things that can go wrong in the future and things you might do now to mitigate those disasters. Okay? And we'll think of some of those things. 
Uh, There's another future deal I was heavily involved in, uh, the artificial heart, mainly as a, a critic, uh, in the 80s. And at the time, there were many, many, many people who predicted that by now, we'd be implanting 100,000 artificial hearts a year. They were serious thinkers saying that. Uh, we're planning about one a year, and they're all experimental, and so far none of them have done anybody any earthly good. Uh, the reason Captain Picard is here, if you hardcore science fiction fans know that, Captain Picard had an artificial heart, right? And in one of the episodes, he had to get it repaired. And for him, it worked so well, nobody even knew he had it. Right? In the real world, forget that. Someday, I had, I'm not, I'm not anti-science, anti-artificial heart. I actually think it would be great to have an artificial heart that was forgettable, totally implantable and forgettable. Right now, they rely on external drive shafts that are the size of a refrigerator, and you have to take them with you wherever you go. So not a great, not a great accomplishment yet, but maybe in the future. Uh, Margaret Atwood, you may think, goes... It goes a little, gets a little carried away, right? <laughs> and she does. This is her, her uh, apocalyptic trilogy here, which I actually highly recommend. Uh, and we're going to talk mostly uh, about a specific uh, character, Craig, uh, later on. And Craig is the one who redesigns human beings. And he wants to redesign them so that they're pacifist. Uh, they only have to eat vegetables. Uh, they have no uh, sexual uh, competition with each other. And uh, they live very well with nature. All right. To do that, however, he had to destroy every other human being on the planet. So that uh, quite a, quite a, a uh, trade-off. More realistically, to talk about real scientists, not science fiction scientists, uh, we'll use George Church as an example. And I'm not picking on George. I like George. I think he's a terrific guy and he's brilliant. But he has some crazy ideas, like all brilliant people do. Right? He has some very good ideas, too. And he's a, a sound geneticist at Harvard. But he's gotten himself in a little bit of trouble last year, um, or two years ago, when he wrote a book called Regenesis and made a couple of both predictions and some suggestions. And his first suggestion was to resurrect the Neanderthal man. And as you probably know, it turns out we have 2 to 3% of our DNA as Neanderthal. So that led George to thinking, not that we need more Neanderthals, but that there might be some uh, advantage to trying to resurrect the Neanderthal man. And ultimately, he decided you couldn't just resurrect one. You had to have a whole community of them. He thought that would be a pretty neat idea. Uh, well, how would you do it? And he said he used a basic cloning technology that was used in Jurassic Park. Uh, not quite, but that, that he would uh, get DNA from amber, uh, that's leftover, right? Uh, we can't find any of that yet, but I assume, assume we could. And then he would uh, implant that DNA in a human egg and then find a, what he called an adventurous female to be the surrogate mother to gestate the Neanderthal man. And that's, that's he didn't get in trouble with, for suggesting Neanderthal man uh, come about, although, you know, come back, although I think he should have, because uh, he's the only geneticist I know who want to go backwards in human evolution instead of forwards. Uh, but he got in trouble for making that comment about an adventurous female. People thought that was sexist and wrong, and uh, that it would be an unethical experiment in any event. So we could talk about whether you think that. This is, uh, uh, the other project he had was to resurrect the woolly mammoth. And that's, a lot of scientists are trying to do that. That's crazy. The only guy who's done the woolly mammoth, I would suggest, is Damien Hirst, uh, my favorite artist and, and certainly the most famous commercial artist in the world. And what Damien did is he bought a uh, woolly mammoth skeleton. <laughs> he took it apart put gold leaf on all the, all the bones and put it back together. And there it is. Uh, he's resurrected, he has in a sense, uh, resurrected the woolly mammoth. And that's the only way the woolly mammoth will ever be resurrected. But, but that's okay, that, that's good. He calls this uh, creation gone but not forgotten. And he says a homage to the, to the mammoth, but also he says a uh, uh, homage to death. And that, uh, we're probably not going to solve that problem, but we'll talk about it later. Well, I want to concentrate on human genetics rather than on 
genetics with animals or genetics with plants. And what things we as a society think are reasonable to use genetics for and what things might be uh, problematic. And this is uh, the overall overarching issue that John and I have been discussing for <laughs> well, 40 years, I think, is true. All right. And, of course, the main uh, uh, thoughtful science fiction book on this is Brave New World uh, with, the, with the Bolkonsky process, which made 96 identical human beings in a batch. We batched humans and then uh, uh, used the basic behavioral methodologies to make them happy with whatever caste we put them in. The, the alphas, the betas, the epsilons, the deltas, uh, and a combination of genetics and drugs made a perfect group of people totally contented. Right. Uh, that's science fiction. <laughs> the idea that we can that we can have that kind of control over over human nature or what humans do uh, is is strange. It's more. This is more more likely, right? Uh, this is to women saying, he's very much like Leo Tolstoy, except he doesn't write. <laughs> That's most of But every once in a while, though, you get exactly what you asked for from the sperm bank. Look, lady, you're the one who asked for the famous movie star with the dark hair, strong nose, and deep set eyes. <laughs> <Glad we got some. laughs> That's right. So, so sometimes it works. So the, the, the uh, event that caused the most consternation and the most publicity in genetics was the birth of Dolly the sheep. Not the birth of a human, but the birth of a sheep. Uh, and that's Ian Wilmot up in the corner uh, with Dolly. And, and Dolly really shook people up. There's no question about it. And the question we want to ask is why? What was it about Dolly that bothered people? I mean, one thing bothered people a lot. Well, are we going to do this to humans? And so far it's turned out we can't do it. We don't know how it works. Uh, everybody, most people, including me, thought that it wasn't going to be that long until you could do this with a human being. But you can't. And you want to talk about why, why that scene is problematic. Uh, but Congress, the Bush administration, obviously, uh, but not the Clinton administration in the beginning, uh, wanted to outlaw human cloning altogether. Uh, we actually went to the UN and tried to get a treaty passed not just to outlaw human cloning, but to outlaw all embryo research, which was a bridge too far, right? Uh, it's one thing to say we're not going to use cloning to make babies. It's totally a different thing, I think, although if you believe embryos are people, you do not, uh, that to outlaw using cloning to make medicine is, uh, is retrograde and just is wrong. It's denying benefits without burdens, it seems to me. Uh, but it's all kind of bled into the Human Genome Project uh, and what that was all about. Uh, the Human Genome Project, the genome was first roughly sequenced uh, in the year 2000. And those are the covers from Science and Nature, the two big uh, science magazines, each with their own take on the genome, but each making it, each artist at least, what the scientists did, we can argue, making it very clear that they saw the genome in human terms. The, the genes were producing humans, <laughs> and that the center for the genome, these are little faces up in the, the nature one, by the way, those are all people, they're not just little bits and pieces. Uh, and that the key to the genome was that we should always keep human values first, human rights and human dignity, uh, not, you know, reductionism, the little parts, and put the little parts and pieces together, uh, and think that the important thing is the molecules. James Watson, as you probably know, uh, used to say that we used to think that our future was in the stars, but now we know that our future is in our genes. Okay. And of course, it was just the opposite, right? We used to know that our future was in our stars. Now we think our future is in our genes, and we really do. And some people want to use genetics to make perfect people, or at least better people, better humans. And who would, who would argue that we have the perfect human right now, right? that we're all perfect. Uh, although this artist's conception, as you see, the, the perfect man has no penis. So, <laughs> and some of you may think that's exactly right, right? But not me. I think that's probably a big mistake. <laughs> be a big mistake. Right? 
And uh, the issue that, that John and I tangled with uh, quite you know, one of the, at the beginning was the whole issue that George Church brought up of so-called surrogate mothers. I just call them mothers, but you can call them surrogate mothers, and the law kind of does, which is having a baby for somebody else. All right. Mary Beth White has, was, was the first surrogate mother, uh, although we use, she used her own egg and the sperm of, uh, of Dr. Stern to have a baby. And it became a giant legal case, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. It's like the leading case, uh, back, even though it was back in 19, 1988, uh, of, of surrogate mother. And who's the mother? No. And this one, John and I absolutely disagree. <laughs> I think the mother is the woman who has a baby. Okay, it's interesting. The U.S. Immigration Service agrees with me finally, <laughs> just this week. Uh, whereas John would say it's the contracting couple, uh, it's the intended parents, which is an interesting argument. Uh, this was our, our debate back in what is this? 1988. 1988. Uh, I thought the Baby M case was decided exactly right. <laughs> and it was against public policy to get involved in baby selling. This was close enough to baby selling. And once you do custody, you have to do custody based on the best interest of the child. Kind of, you know, it sounds like I'm an old traditionalist, but I just think the law happened to be right there. John thought I was wrong. It's John. It's, <laughs> it's kind of scary, actually, for us to look at ourselves this long ago <laughs> when we used to be young and tough and all right. Uh, but anyway. Procreative rights, of John and Mr. Procreative Liberty, as I'm sure you know, uh, ignored by the courts. And absolutely right, they were. <laughs> they were, as they should have been. No. Uh, and we'll go back to Margaret Atwood again. Margaret Atwood's uh, a different novel. You know, she's quite prolific. Uh, the Handmaid's Tale was actually her cut, on, uh, her cut on surrogacy. And the Canadian Supreme Court, as many of you know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, ruled, that, uh, ruled against commercial surrogacy as well. He's, simply outlawed in Canada, and they thought that was, they said that was fine. Surrogacy is not outlawed, it's commercial surrogacy. It's a buying and selling of uh, reproductive services, whether it's a uterus, renting a uterus, or uh, embryos, or even uh, sperm and eggs. Okay. And that's very controversial. There's a whole movement in the United States now, actually, to, to amend our uh, organ, organ transplant bill, which prohibits the purchase and sale of organs for transplant. I think, and that's been the law in the United States since 1984. I think that's right, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people want to have a market in kidneys. Um, and some people want to have a market in babies, too, or at least in surrogate mothers, right? And India has become the go-to country, uh, although so is the United States, uh, to hire, hire surrogate mothers to, uh, to have babies for you. Okay. Now, before we look at, at the human rights in this context, we have to at least consider uh, Peter Singer's argument. And his argument is not that human rights are bad, but that human rights are elitist. Right? My friend Peter would say, and does say, that to say that humans are special is to be speciesist, right? is to uh, put yourself above, put humans above animals. <laughs> which I don't think is a big leap, by the way, but he does. No, I think humans are above animals. I got no problem with that. I don't want to make animals suffer. I don't want to hurt them. Uh, but, um, but I think it's a category mistake to think that we need to give animals human rights or anything approaching human rights. Um, so you know, at the beginning of my career, I went to Australia to meet with Peter. And Peter took me out to lunch. And I ordered the fish out of a steak. And I said, Peter, this was back in 1978, come on. I said, Peter, I thought you ate fish. And he says, no. He says, do you know how they die? <laughs> That's what I want to hear about fish uh, suffocating to death as I try to eat my entree. Right? But so I went back and reread his book. I'd read his book. And here's, here's what Peter says. He puts the line on sentient beings somewhere between an oyster and a shrimp. Okay. All right. Fine. I mean, let's give it. Let's, let's not, and he does this because he thinks the shrimp has a sophisticated enough nervous system that they could feel pain when you fry them or put them in hot water. Whereas, poor little oyster apparently doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. In any event, uh, I like the line between humans and animals. He likes the line between oysters and shrimp. So call me a speciesist, uh, but we have, but we are, uh, clearly are familiar with the fact 
that in order to kill people or torture people, whether it's war or anything else, we have to dehumanize them. We really have a hard time. Humans have a hard time killing other humans, thank God, and torturing other humans. So what we do to torture them is we dehumanize them. One of the most famous pictures of this example is obviously in Abu Ghraib, where the soldiers were literally, this is true, by the way, were literally ordered to treat the, the prisoners like animals. Uh, General Miller told uh, General Karpinski, I want them treated like dogs. I want them treated like dogs. I don't want them to have any thought that they're humans uh, or that they're in, in, in a, any category like we are. And, and the result was, of course, they were treated just like dogs. Right? Had a case in the U.S. Federal District Court in D.C. this week, actually last week, uh, of a prisoner in Guantanamo who's being treated exact, even worse than this, right? like a dog. He can't walk, so they took away his wheelchair, and they took away his underwear. It's true, testimony, uncontested testimony in, in that, uh, in order to get him to stop his hunger strike. Uh, I think you can't do that to human beings. I'm not arguing it's torture, but it's cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and prohibited by the Geneva Conventions. Because once you start treating someone like an animal, there's no end to what you can do with them. Right? Uh, there are experiments on individual humans, right? We have a lot of experience with that. But there are also experiments on the entire human race. And those are the ones I want to spend most of my time on. Because I believe, I used to believe, we had a conversation with some of you at lunchtime, uh, that we should prohibit all species altering procedures. Any procedure that had as its goal altering the primary human characteristics of the species. Okay. And I'm kind of fond of that. I'm fond of all my suggestions. But, but on reflection over the last decade, I thought that maybe I went too far there. And so the, uh, the, the more reasonable proposal is to outlaw species endangering procedures under the theory that not all species altering procedures are species endangering. Right? Um, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with, with Kurt Vonnegut's Ice Nine. Um, he didn't think that, you know, the people who wanted to do that, uh, the Marine general who said his troops were sick of slogging through mud, wanted the scientists to produce something that would end mud, would take the water out of mud. And they did. It was called Ice Nine. Uh, what they didn't have was a way to stop it from taking the water out of everything else on the planet. And so it eventually destroys all life on the planet. Now that's again science fiction, but it is plausible that our scientists could come up with something uh, that, uh, that destroyed, if not all human life, most human life. And something that was so destructive that we might want to say, I would want to say, shouldn't be done unless we can figure out some kind of mechanism whereby the entire world's population could vote on it, could decide whether or not this was something that we wanted to do. Okay. Now, scientists are not evil. Scientists all want to do something, do good, and mostly they do. All right? uh, but recently, the primary obsession, not with all scientists, but with some scientists, and especially scientists on the West Coast. You know, you're right in the middle of the country. That's great. You know? But there's a big distinction between East Coast and West Coast that, that I see whenever I go out to the West Coast. You know, you know, they take things seriously that we laugh at. Uh, like the project, the Immortality Project. They actually believe that the reason we die is we don't know enough and that we can learn. We'll, we're going to learn more, right? Um, Kurzweil and, and the, the notion of the singularity, which is when humans merge with machines, after which we'll live forever, but not as humans anymore. But that's okay. That's a, they think that's a small price to pay uh, for immortality. And you might, you might agree with them. Uh, the year's 2045. Right? And Kurzweil and others want to be, be able to live at least till 2045. I thankfully will be long dead. Not that I want to die, but I have no interest in becoming a machine uh, in order, order to live by the year 2045. Most of you won't. Most of you are going to be around to see this or not see it. Okay? And Google is going to help. Uh, Google has uh, taken on death as a project. This really is one of their X projects. Right? Uh, and the Time Magazine asked last year, uh, can Google solve death? And the answer is no, by the way. But uh, that will not keep them from trying. Uh, and, 
And they, they again, think that, uh, that there is uh, reason to believe that this is just an information gap problem. You know, if you collect enough information, you can solve death. You may have read in the Wall Street Journal three days ago, Google has added a new, a, a new project. In this, pro this interview, uh, Larry Page says, you know, I, he just found out that if we cured cancer, we'd only increase life expectancy by three years. And he says, nah, it's nothing. So forget, let's forget cancer. Let's go after something bigger. <laughs> All right. This week it's been announced that Google is backing off on that. And they actually are going after cancer. <laughs> they think now cancer is a pretty good idea. What they want to do is put thousands of little nanobots in your body to monitor everything that goes on in your body. They admit there's some technical problems to that. Uh, and then they think, with that monitoring, we can cure your cancer while it's still at the molecular level before it would be even, even detectable. I think that's a reasonable thing to work on. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's going to cure death, I think, is, is, is way open. Well, you don't have to talk about Hitler. Whenever you talk about Hitler, you know, you're in, you, you do, you've lost the, the battle. Right? But we do have to talk about discrimination, and we do have to talk about equality. Human rights is all about, right, the fundamental philosophy of human rights is non-discrimination. Every, every major human rights treaty, that's it, non-discrimination. You cannot discriminate against people on any basis, whether, you know, race, religion, national origin, age, gender discrimination, et cetera, all right? So that's, that's number one. So the first question with altering physical characteristics of humans is what will happen? What's the result? All right. And there's a little debate on this. Actually, the, it was the, the uh, people who are in favor of this uh, who first suggested that once we enhance humans, once we enhance humans, uh, make them super intelligent, super strong, uh, have you know, long memories, not require sleep, whatever, that we're going to divide humanity into two categories, the enhanced and the unenhanced. All right? and this will set us up for what I've called, this is my term, not there, genetic genocide. That either one of two things is going to happen. Either the superior humans will see us regular humans as animals, right, and therefore perfect fodder to be enslaved or killed or whatever, you know, use whatever they wanted to uh, and take us over in that sense or even kill us, use us for food. Or more likely, the uh, garden variety humans will feel themselves threatened by the superhumans and kill them before they can be killed themselves. Either way, it's a bad outcome. All right. Now, what's the probability of that? Who knows the answer? That's the pro hard part of the, about the future is figuring out probabilities. But how high does it have to be in order to say we shouldn't do that? We shouldn't enhance humans in a way that could foster uh, genocide in, uh, in the world. So there have been two answers to this. To my <laughs> One answer was, hey, we do genocides now without worrying about genetics, so we should get over that. Now, I don't think that's a good answer, but I understand that that's true. <laughs> we, could, we could be discriminatory against each other without, without in any way uh, doing genetic enhancements, right? Uh, and the second argument is that really speculative, I mean, could, everything could work out fine, and the burden of proof should be on those people who want to regulate, as it usually is, rather than use the precautionary principle and put the burden of proof on those who want to change the way uh, we do science, okay? So, so again, the question is, what's the probability? And this is a kind of a wild made up thing, but I kind of like it because I made it up. Uh, what I would say is, okay, let's do it this way. If we can go 300 years without a genocide, go ahead, knock yourself out, then you can change, change humanity. And they'd say, that's too long. We're not, well, so anyway, but what is it? What's, what should be the test? What should be the empirical test of when humanity has moved beyond uh, genocide uh, based on human characteristics? Uh, and we talked a little bit at lunch about what would happen if an obstetrician delivered a baby with wings. I think, but I may be wrong. Uh, there's be two. One would be immediate amputation, although I would hope you consult with the mother, but maybe not. Uh, and the other would be 
I'm not saying this to be cruel, uh, that this baby would wind up in a zoo, a freak show of some sort. It would be a freak in the sense it would be different and unique and there'd be no baby like it uh, in the world. Well, maybe not, all right? Uh, in World War II, as we have to do in any war to kill people, we dehumanize the Japanese, right? Uh, and uh, if you read the New York Times magazine this week about uh, the adventures of a guy who was held prisoner in Syria for the last two years, he was totally dehumanized as well, so his captors could could beat him. They called him, well, it's called him scum, but they also called him dog, animal. You're an animal, you know, you're not a human being. And, and, and they meant that. And, I, and again, we need, we need to do that to, uh, to, in, to in any way uh, try to change the human species. And then we'll, we'll look at it from higher and lower. The real action is not just in, it is in genetics, but it's not just in genetics. I mean, Craig Venter's a geneticist, but he wants to do more than, than change human beings. In fact, that's really not his, his goal. His goal is to do synthetic life or artificial life. His goal is to create life, new life forms, uh, in the laboratory. And he posits that he can do this, and he's created some synthetic uh, bacteria already, uh, although they're not new. But he's posited he can do that because genomics, the base pairs of DNA can be translated into digital, can be digitalized, translated into computer language, and then you can use that computer language back again, and, and you read that computer language back to make a biological creature. And that's probably right. I mean, he's not talking about humans. He's not talking about the Star Trek transporter, you know, where <laughs> Scotty can beam you up or down. Uh, he's talking about microbes, you know, bacteria and, uh, and viruses. But as he says, if I could do this, he thinks he can, then instead of sending men to Mars <laughs> to try to get samples, we can send, uh, you know, send an unmanned spacecraft there, and it can beam back and capture a sample, sequence it, beam back the sequence to Earth, and we can, we can make a, a, a creature out of that. Okay. That's fine. Uh, the question is, is it safe? Right? Is it safe? That's the question we began with. Uh, back in 1973, the good old hippie days. In Cambridge, uh, there was a movement when recombinant DNA first started, the first time changes in the genetic code were possible and were, were made. Uh, there was a movement by scientists to stop it, to say this is too dangerous. And they had a big meeting at a similar in California, and they decided, again, there, was no, there were no lawyers there. Oh, well, there actually were some lawyers there, but this was not a regulatory thing. This was scientists self-regulating. And they decided they should stop their experiments with recombinant DNA on E. coli, which is a resident of your gut, because they were too dangerous. They were afraid something was going to escape from the lab and hurt people. So they came up with two things to prevent danger. One was to do their research in special laboratories, which had good containment systems to make the release of uh, dangerous organisms unlikely. And number two, uh, they re-engineered the organism itself so it couldn't live in the wild. It couldn't live outside the organism. And people were happy with that, so they went back and started doing their research again uh, a year later. And everything, you know, this was a long time, 40 years ago, and everything seemed to be fine until about a year and a half ago when two teams, one in the United States and one in the Netherlands, uh, <clears throat> tried to increase the potency of H5N1 flu, uh, which had not been transmissible between humans, uh, to a point where it was transmissible in humans. In other words, they tried to increase the function. It's called gain-of-function research. They tried to make a dangerous organism much more dangerous. All right? And, and they did it in ferrets, they didn't do it in humans, these are like little, cute little ferrets. And the question it was, and a lot of scientists picked up on this question, was this a species endangering experiment? Should this experiment ever have been done? And whether it should or not, should it ever be done again? All right? And it actually seems to me the answer to that is easy, but it's not easy, but you know, that, of course you should never ever <laughs> do an experiment, the goal of which is to make a bacteria or a virus or any pathogen 
uh, to humans out there, more dangerous to humans. Who could possibly consent to that experiment? The ferrets, I guess. The ferrets said it was OK. Uh, I mean, who has the moral? or legal authority to consent to that experiment. Anyway, the long and short it was, there had been, been debate, there was a moratorium, they finally agreed to a moratorium right away. And then there have been debates ever since then. And just last week, as you probably know, President Obama announced no more funding for this type of research uh, from NIH or the federal government uh, un until we really sit down and think this thing out. I mean, I think when you sit down and think this thing out, you gotta say no more funding for this type of research ever. Better you have to say no more research like this, but we don't run the whole world, obviously. So that's a start. But, uh, but I think that's right. Most of the stuff we're doing is because of 9-11 and bioterrorism, and, and it's, a, it's a big problem because it, it makes us think of things that we're doing as defensive. In fact, that was the rationale for the uh, flu research, right? We want to make a vaccine before it becomes dangerous. Well, great, I mean, that's a great rationale, but it may never become dangerous. And, uh, you know, we don't want to make it dangerous, therefore justifying our research on the vaccine um, that way. All right, now poor little ferrets get to have to get locked up to do that. But, uh, so let me, so a lot of that stuff seems very theoretical. Let me take this quickly, and then we'll wrap up, and apply this to the Ebola uh, pandemic, okay? The Ebola pandemic, we thought we had law, and we thought we had an international organization to run with the law. The World Health Organization, we thought, I'm not just me, everybody thought, was set up to do things just exactly like this, to deal with uh, emerging infectious diseases and to stop them when they could. They also have a set of what are called international health regulations. That's their name. But none of you law students here know that. And that they're not real regulations. <laughs> they are guidelines, right? You all remember Ghostbusters, right, when Bill Murray is being seduced by Sigourney Weaver, who's a spirit and has been possessed. And Bill Murray says, um, you know, I have a rule about not having sex with spirits. And he looks at her again, he says, well, maybe it's more like a guideline. <laughs> well, these are guidelines, is what these are. They're very nice that uh, WHO can declare a public health emergency of international concern, and then uh, we expect people to respond to it, but there's two conditions of the response. One, the good condition, that you <laughs> have to always respect the dignity and human rights and freedoms of persons, that's good. The second one is bad. Well, you might think it's good too. That the sovereign right of each state remains to legislate and implement health policies, all right? And that's the basis of the United Nations, I'm sure you know as well, right? It's based on sovereignty. And until we break that sovereignty, we're never gonna move anywhere toward any type of global agreements on anything, all right, except to say countries can if they want, uh, let, let WHO in, can cooperate, but you know, totally up to them. Right? So when Doctors Without Borders ask the World Health Organization to take over the response to Ebola in Liberia, in uh, Sierra Leone, and in Guinea, uh, Margaret Chan said we can't do it. We don't have the resources. She didn't say we didn't have the, the charge. They don't really have the charge either. But they didn't have, simply don't have the resource. So nobody could do it. It was very, very, very embarrassing. It's, it's even though uh, there have been major, major events in the last few years where the World Health Organization has tried to take a lead. They took a lead in SARS. It did very well. They took a lead in H1N1 there. One might say they overreacted in 2009. And earlier this year, they took a lead in polio, all of these being declared uh, international health uh, emergencies, okay? But when Meds on Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, asked them to come in to Africa, they said they couldn't do it. So it's very, very embarrassing. It should be to the international community that a private, not-for-profit NGO, <laughs> Doctors Without Borders, even though a very distinguished one, uh, has to take the lead for the whole country, the whole world. We've got no governments uh, willing to do that uh, at the beginning. And Docs Without Borders, as many of you know, is founded on exactly the opposite principle that the United Nations is founded on, that sovereignty shouldn't matter, that, that suffering and disease is universal, and doctors have a universal, they would say, duty to interfere, a duty to help people who are sick, whether, whether or not they're behind a state border, 
Okay, so that's where the, the word comes from. I mean, the, the name of their organization comes from, too, is Doctors Without Borders. That's what they mean by that. Now, can they do that? They were able to do that for a long time and still, until medical neutrality kind of went away in the world. And now we're shooting doctors and nurses all around the world in all kinds of civil wars. And it's no longer safe for them to, to quote, interfere in countries that obviously are in turmoil. Uh, but they had the right idea. I think they absolutely have the right idea. Now, when President Obama decided finally, but God bless him, he's right to do it, that the United States is going to take the leadership role here. If nobody else will do it, finally. Uh, but he couldn't decide, and he still hasn't decided, whether this is a public health emergency or a national security emergency. And one might say, who cares? Right? Who cares? Well, I care. I mean, I want to know whether we're going there to help people's health or whether we're going there for national security. One, one reason is because you want to know who you send there. Right? Uh, normally, we do not send the military to do public health. And we don't send our public health people to do national security. Both those things are true. Uh, and the reason we don't do that is because in many countries, not all, think, but, but in many countries, when our military goes in there, people are scared. And they shoot, they're afraid they're going to get killed by our military. And in many countries, they are. That's what the military are for. Uh, so Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, again, Doctors Without Borders, never deals with the military. That's their, they just don't, they don't do it because the long-term effect on their organization is they look like they are in cahoots with the military and they can't do their job that way. Nonetheless, in this, in this particular event, uh, the military was essential. So this has caused a lot of consternation, right? We sent our military over not to do health care, not to do public health, but to do infrastructure building, to build 17 hospitals and to pave some roads and to open, a, open a, and set up a staging area and open up a, um, uh, an airport. Absolutely essential work. In fact, after the president decided to do this, the, the, uh, the governments of England and France immediately said, God, you know, why didn't we think of that kind of, and both sent their militaries to their former colonies. Kind of poetic justice, we're dealing with former colonies now. Liberia, obviously, is not our former colony, but that's the only country we could go to because that's the only one that invited us in, right? And sovereignty means we can't go anywhere without being invited in. So England went to their colony, Sierra Leone and France went to their colony, Giddy. And, and who knows what's happening over there? The data is not good, but it looks like we might have turned a corner there. But, uh, and, and that the reason we did, one reason we did, was because of, uh, of the military. So very confusing. Uh, similar argument with Ebola in the United States. I mean, we have an, a real epidemic of Ebola in Africa. We have an epidemic of fear in the United States. Um, and here we're trying to figure out, is this a state problem or a federal problem? I think that's a good question. It's probably both, all right? But uh, historically, as you all know, states have had the public and the police powers. States have had quarantine powers. And the federal government's only gotten involved in public health when it has to do with interstate or international commerce, right? So that's where we get the airports and, you know, obviously. And, but the other area, of course, is national security. So if there's a national security problem, the federal government gets to take over the whole area, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. So we don't, haven't done that. The president has said, oh, his spokespeople have said, the states have all the authority here. We don't have authority. Uh, not true, but you don't have it unless you want it and challenge the states. That's true. You're going to have to say it's a national security problem, not just in Africa, but in the United States. In fact, they did say that, right? When they locked up, uh, Governor Christie locked up uh, uh, Lacey Hitchcock, and then she was sent to Maine and locked up, well, threatened to be locked up again. Uh, the White House said, this is a national security problem. You shouldn't do that. Because doctors and nurses from the United States won't go to Africa to help out. And that's going to make it less likely that the epidemic will be contained, which is going to make it more likely that these countries are going to fall apart, right? And that's going to be a national security problem for us because new groups like ISIS will, will emerge from the chaos, okay? But the only point is here, we haven't thought any of, these stuff, any of this through very well. Uh, we're not ready to say who's in charge. Nobody's in charge. I mean, Doctors Without Borders is as, is as in charge as we are. Uh, we seem to be in charge in Liberia, actually we be in the United States, which is kind of interesting, right? But obviously have nothing to do with Guinea or uh, 
Sierra Leone. That's so very confusing. All right, I'm not going to do this. So let's start we'll end, end with this. So we do have frameworks, but we haven't figured out which ones we want to use. We have a basic social justice framework. I uh, call it the Paul Farmer framework if you want to talk about people working in, in Ebola now. Paul, unlike everybody else, everybody else says this is an emergency we have to solve now. Paul says, no, it's not an emergency. It's a problem of poverty uh, and problem of having no good infrastructure there. We can't solve it immediately. We're going to have to take a long-term view and build up a public health and a health care system in the country. And so he, his, he has, in Partners in Health, pledged that all of his work, all of his work that goes on there is going to have at least a three-year time frame, not a three-month or, or a three-week time frame. Uh, the Human Rights Framework is, of course, the framework uh, that many of us think is the right framework based on human dignity, non-discrimination, and even the right to health, right? And the Health and Human Rights Framework, which is kind of a combination of human rights emphasizing health, uh, is a framework that's universal based on human dignity, uh, enforceable in its own kind of way, includes the right to health, non-discrimination <laughs> principle being the most important principle, and the other interesting thing about health and human rights, and human rights, is governments have special obligations to women and children. And actually it's been women and children who've been treated the worst in the Ebola uh, epidemic in, in that pregnant women who need cesareans aren't able to get to hospitals. There are no hospitals that will take them in, and many, many have, have been dying just because of that, because there's no secondary hospital. All the hospitals are devo devoted to Ebola. And then there's the, uh, the argument that I've been making uh, today, that there are some things that actually are so bad that put, the, put, the, uh, put humans at such risk as a species that they can be called crimes against humanity. Um, that can seem like an overstatement, but I don't think so. I think that at some level, uh, that, that is exactly right. But so I'll leave you with the challenge. The challenge really is to come up with universals, universal, universal principles, not just that we believe in, but that, that we can go the next step forward and, and try to enforce. And they would be things like equality, uh, things like the right to health, and things that not taking immortality seriously as a goal. Thank you very much. Right. You want the earth, huh? I have to speak against the uh, image of a skull at death. <laughs> no, you can have it. Okay. Well, well, thank you, and uh, hello and welcome, and good to see so many people here. And I, I want a, a special thanks to George Annis for coming all the way here to uh, present to, to, to us and give us the last chapter of his uh, emerging book. Uh, I just want to mention, as George did, I've known George since, I think, 1969, and I've actually worked in this field due to George's inspiration when I was uh, thinking of academia and where I should go, and George was already there doing health law and uh, patient rights and such, and I realized this is where I want to go as well. So. He really inspired me to uh, get into the field and has encouraged me at many, many points when I needed encouragement. Uh, and I'm very grateful for George for that. That being said, uh, we haven't always agreed no, on, on, on everything, but that's been fruitful a as well. So I'm going to note some of our disagreements here. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about Ebola uh, issues because it wasn't in the chapter. I'm, I'm going to focus on George's chapter, That's fair. which is the genomics future, uh, uh, where there's a lot of talk about threats to species and George's arguments against genetic enhancement and such. And, and uh, let me just start out by saying that uh, with regard to new uh, genetic and reproductive technologies, the ability to fertilize eggs outside the body, preserve uh, embryos and eggs by freezing them, uh, uh, doing egg donation, sperm donation, gestational surrogate motherhood, and then uh, genetic alteration and screening of embryos and, uh, uh, and fetuses and uh, either discarding them or aborting them, that whole array of issues we may call reprogenetics. It's not a felicitous term, but it describes the area. Uh, th there are basically three uh, uh, general approaches one could take. One could be a traditionalist 
and say the sky is falling with any of them, uh, let's not do them at all, be on Cass, very influential bioethicist and uh, uh, who ran a pr pr presidential commission on this, basically taking that view, we should never use these, uh, at least the reproductive technologies that would separate out uh, uh, conception from, um, uh, from, from, uh, from intercourse, uh, all those laboratory techniques. Uh, there's also another view, you might call it the, uh, at the other pole, would be the libertarian view. Anything goes, no matter what. The, the Ray Kurzweil and others, and it would even go further in some of the ways that George has talked about. Well, George and I are in neither of those categories. We're neither traditionalists nor unstoppable libertarians. Uh, we, we fall into what I'd call a, a modern traditionalists. Uh, that might sound like a uh, contradiction in terms, but you can have uh, modern classical music. What is Phil Glass but, uh, and John Adams, but modern classical music? And so I think our approach is uh, 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 modern traditionalists. We want to preserve some of the, uh, most of the old values about harming and, and respecting family and respecting the welfare of offspring, but we also want to take advantage of these technologies. And within that group of modern traditionalists, um, there are those who uh, are liberal modern traditionalists. I put myself in that category, uh, can do things as long as uh, there's uh, no compelling uh, harm that would come from, from them. Uh, and indeed, there may be rights to engage in some of these. And then there are also conservative modern traditionalists. And I would put George <laughs> in, in that category. It's a horrible uh, term. <laughs> uh, conservative modern traditionalists. Again, I'm not uh, looking for felicity here. I'm just looking for <laughs> categorization, cat categorization. So, uh, uh, so just to recognize that difference where we fall out and uh, say a couple things about that, how that comes out. So, so let me just start with George's uh, futuristic concern about threat to the species, threat to the species. And that bothers me, George, that bothers me. We've got, we've got hunger, we've got strife, we've got climate change, we've got Ebola, uh, we've got overpopulation, we've got shrinking resources. These are real problems, and here you are with all your power and your intelligence, and you're worried about extinction of the species? Is that really a serious issue? I just want to question whether that, that, that is a serious issue and uh, whether there's a threat there of any sort. Uh, yes, it's uh, fun for science fiction fans to, uh, uh, to uh, think about it and generate uh, novels and films and, and art. Uh, that, that's fine, but in fact, I don't see it as much of a threat and just uh, want to call that to, uh, you know, just point, point that, that out. Um, and, and one of the reasons is that, um, uh, you know, aside, well, it could happen through climate change, through uh, nuclear war. Uh, it would be just our species, but others as well. Um, and also the idea about making a superhuman race uh, that would lead to the strife that George talks about. Um, you know, it's not really scalable, George. It's so important. What are there? How many billions of people are there in the world now? Is it 10 billion there? I, I think it is. To how are you going to scale up making a superhuman, superhumans to replace all the others? And you can say, well, uh, you only have to do a small number and power, but then who's going to produce all the things that are needed? I, I just don't see how that would happen, or at least that it would be uh, uh, in any sense close enough or near enough to occupy us other than for play and intellectual fasc fascination but not uh, something that should concern us in terms of human rights uh, in healthcare. Uh, uh, and, and so just on that note, I just want to mention a couple philosophical issues that would arise in thinking about what we do now and its possible effect on the future. And there, there's, a, there's a very difficult set of philosophical problems about what is our duty to future generations. To what extent do we have a duty to limit our own activities in order to protect or recognize the interests of people who aren't even here, who may never be born, uh, especially several generations on, who are just 
hypotheticals, if if there are any, uh, we, we perhaps have a feeling of that. But there's a there, there's a complex philosophical literature about that, and perhaps in the discussion afterwards, John D. from the philosophy department and who in the law school here might have something to say about how that debate has worked out or where it is uh, in terms of our obligations to the future and future people uh, many generations off. I, I think that's a key philosophical issue that George's concerns about, uh, about species effects or, or future effects uh, need to take account of. The second philosophical issue that I think is key throughout any of the reprogenetic areas, the idea that doing things are harmful to the offspring who are born, the offspring of, uh, of gestational surrogates, uh, the offspring who are born after genetic screening or genetic alteration, or any of that kind of experimentation on embryos or on cloning that would lead to uh, new individuals being born, uh, whenever anyone deals with that, they've got to deal with what in philosophy is called the non-identity problem, that um, the alteration, the genetic alteration or the activity in question ends up leading to a different person being born than otherwise would have been born if you didn't engage in it. So, so that if uh, uh, a couple having a, a baby doesn't use one of these techniques, that child who was born will be different than the one who uh, is born as a result of using the techniques. And Derek Parfit, the philosopher, famous philosopher has explored this, as have many others. It's called the non-identity problem. And so uh, it, it, it's not that there's a clear answer, but one has to take account of that in arguing that, for example, cloning an individual, that the resulting person has been harmed by that, because if they hadn't been cloned, they never would have existed in the first place. And from their perspective, uh, viewed solely from their perspective and their individual interests, it may be very difficult to say that uh, on a person harming theory of harm, that they've been harmed. So again, this is an issue that has to be paid attention to in any debates about this. So, so take, for example, uh, I'm fascinated by this too, the idea of the Neanderthal, uh, uh, a Neanderthal individual being born uh, today as a result of these experiments, uh, we have to separate out taking some of the Neanderthal DNA, parts of the, uh, the genome where the human genome, uh, uh, the modern human departs from the Neanderthal genome. There will be many sections of the code where that is so, and replacing <coughs> or adding to parts of the human genome some of the Neanderthal code. It's not an entire Neanderthal, it's just part of their genetic code, which will <clears throat> lead to an individual being born, I take it, they're human beings and they're, they're going to be persons and have rights and protections uh, there, and to argue that it's wrong to do, do it to infuse Neander some more Neanderthal genes into a person who would not otherwise be born, how do you show that it's harmful to them because this is the only way they would come into existence? And it seems to me that one has to address that. Uh, <clears throat> and it seems to me in that case, the argument would be uh, weak that there be, they're actually harmed uh, there because so little of the genetic code would be changed. I don't know the percentages, but, uh, uh, but that's different than uh, uh, recuperating or uncovering a, a whole Neanderthal genome, as George said, from amber, but from what other sources they found in the many parts around the world uh, where they are, and taking that and, and uh, basically uh, putting it in a human egg and then finding a gestational carrier, a woman, to uh, carry that and bring that to term, uh, would have an individual with um, 
almost all the Neanderthal genome, uh, not the mitochondrial DNA. So it wouldn't be totally Neanderthal. It would still have some human DNA there, you know, 99.5 percent, but it would be, uh, there'd be some uh, modern human there. And again, you have to ask the question, what would be wrong with that? Well, there are many arguments, but if you're looking at it, uh, oh, the poor individual born, um, how bad off they will be, well, one just simply has to address that more of how harmful will it be? And it, you know, what exactly is, is the concern there, if wherever possible? This is not to say that I'm backing this. It's just that when one tries to deal with the objections, one has to address some of these issues. So let me then uh, close with, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a long close, but uh, because I'm going to talk about uh, my final topic uh, is about uh, genetic alteration. And enhancement. Because when you come down to it, uh, I think where George and I and many people in this field would disagree is not over some genetic alteration, some tinkering with the genes, but just particular kinds. So George is a, he, he's, he's a, he's a modern traditionalist, no question about that. He's happy to use these te techniques. When you can show it will, say, cure a disease or uh, inherited disease in a, a child-to-be, uh, you'd be in favor of the techniques become available uh, if, if a couple, take a couple who are both uh, carriers for autosomal recessive disease, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, or others, there's a one in four chance they would have a child uh, with the disease. Uh, they themselves are each a, a carrier, and uh, they do a genetic, uh, they've done genetic screening on themselves to know that they're carriers, but they do, uh, they want to do some uh, prenatal genetic screening, and let's say they do it at the embryo stage. They go through in vitro fertilization so they can get embryos, common technique now, and they then do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of those embryos to see which ones. They produce eight embryos, which is uh, likely. Uh, two of them, on average, will have the, uh, the condition. And these folks believe that it's uh, immoral to throw away any embryos. So they want those embryos with the disease fixed or made healthy. And we can change the hypothetical where they have produced only one embryo one viable embryo, and it's the one that's diseased. So the two and eight doesn't really matter. But they want that, that embryo fixed because they want to have the child who will be born without their disease, out of love and concern for the child. And uh, once this technique is shown to be safe and effective, it would be a gene alteration that will fix the, the, de the de deletion in the F405 uh, 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 locus on, I think it's uh, uh, chromosome 13, and fix that, uh, and a child will be born healthy. And I think George would be in favor of that. I, indeed, he says it in his final chapter of genomic uh, messages. Uh, once he gets away from uh, species, uh, a species uh, threats to species through alteration here, he says he'll be for that. But what George would not be for would be a case, I take it, well, let me throw out the deaf case because this gets, um, th this is uh, brooded about so much here. And I know Je uh, George is, uh, certainly recognizes the rights and interests of subgroups and recognizes, of course George does, that there's a rich uh, culture among people who, uh, who are deaf. Right, George? You, you agree with that and that that should be respected. There's spe special schools, there's special techniques there and maybe co cochlear implants would, uh, not be required parents to do so to preserve that culture. Mm -hmm. So what if you have a deaf couple, and, and a lot of congenital deafness is due to a mutation that affects the small hairs in the inner ear, and uh, a mutation for various reasons that's been uh, passed down, and they have that, uh, they're carriers of that, and so they want to be sure that the child they have is a deaf child as well. 
because they'll be able to raise it and share their culture with them, which they think is a good and important one. I take it, George, if the, if, that if they went through in vitro fertilization, produced embryos and, and screened them and found, uh, say, some embryos with normal hearing and some who would be deaf, that if they chose to implant only the deaf embryos, would you be okay with that, George? No. You wouldn't say that's within the right of that couple to choose which embryos they want? No. Uh, on the ground that the, the child born is certainly not going to be harmed by that because that child would not otherwise be born. And furthermore, it will be living in a, this rich deaf culture, which you agreed to. So what would be wrong with that? Well, I, I'll, I'll finish. Okay, let me throw that out. And I thought, I thought you were going to say, well, that would be okay. But if all their genes, if all the embryos have normal hearing, but the deaf couple wants to raise a deaf child and they then altered the genome to make otherwise normal hearing children to be deaf, that that's what you would disagree with. But you're actually getting off the train earlier. Yeah. Well, uh, and this would be a case, by the way, if you want to bring science in, fiction into it, which uh, I've called intentional diminishment. And this is really the Blade Runner scenario, if mm -hmm. people have ever seen that movie. It just flashed out one time in the early 80s when I saw it that that's a case where the replicants are created to have fewer capacities, uh, a shorter lifespan than they otherwise would have if they had not been engineered to have that part deleted. That would be intentional di diminishment of someone who would otherwise be born with, uh, with uh, normal uh, lifespan characteristics. So intentional diminishment, uh, y y you would be against that. Uh, you'd have to show why that would be harmful and other effects. But uh, y y you're saying even selection without alteration, the choice to have a dead child, a, a deaf child, would be wrong, even though you would not go so far as to say that if a couple had twins and one in utero, uh, 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 fraternal twins, um, and one had hearing and the other was deaf, that there would be an obligation to uh, do selective reduction and termination of the one in utero, because that would save that, that embryo, that fetus from a life as a deaf child, you wouldn't go that far, but probably because of interest of the woman and couple there. But uh, anyway, I want to just throw that out. So, so uh, where I think the real uh, dilemma is going to be for us in the future, in this area, uh, and in this area, and by the way, if we allow some of these things to go on, I don't think it's the first step in a slippery slope toward toward a species extinction or the creation of a superhuman race, and for that reason we shouldn't engage in any of these things. We should just go step by step and see what, what, the, what they are. I, I, I think the concern is going to arise when you take the notion of reproductive liberty and a couple or individual's right to have or not have children, their right to have information about the child they would have before they have it in order to make a more informed decision about that. And if that's so, then wouldn't it follow that they would have a right to alter the genetic characteristics? Because unless they could do so, they would not otherwise engage in re reproduction, that that should be part of their liberty as well. Well, I've gotten us deeply into the the, the weeds, if you will, of this, or uh, people want to say uh, the devil's in the details. I like to think that God is in the details, as Mies van der Rohe uh, said. Uh, so uh, <coughs> somehow we have to get into details to work about this, wor worry about this. Um, so let me end there, and we'll hear George's response, and maybe John D. can help us out here on some of these issues and hear from others in the audience. Thanks, thanks very much for this opportunity. John, thank you very much for that. You know, uh, John's right. We've gone back.
back a long ways. Uh, John and I actually wound up, wound up clerking for the same uh, judge on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and that's where I met him. He clerked the year before me, and I wanted to find out what the hell the judge was like. So, he was great, by the way. Let me just very quickly, because I want to I want to open this up, respond to John's. Uh, what I take it as three main points are. Uh, the first is. Uh, why are we worried about the extinction of species? I mean, probably not going to happen. We got people starving to death uh, every day all around the world. Uh, we got people dying of diarrhea every day all around the world. We got enough racism uh, uh, to deal with without getting involved with losing the whole planet. Uh, and I have some sympathy for that. Uh, in my health and human rights class, I know some of you are taking health and human rights. Uh, we ask the uh, students to, to pick a problem. And as I tell them, there are no shortages <laughs> of real heavy-duty problems in the world, which, which cause people to die, live miserably, uh, live in bad conditions, undignified lives. So yes, you're right. I don't think a lot of people should be engaged in this, but I think some people should. Um, well, it is what we call, uh, what we call, what, what people call low probability, high consequence event. It's, it, it's not likely that this, but if it happens, it'll be catastrophic. So we at least need some people thinking about it. Um, I don't think we need many, but I do think we need some. I think we need a few people thinking about uh, the earth being impacted by a giant meteor. That's going to cause us to go to stay. I don't think a lot of people, I think the odds of that are so low, I would spend very little money on that, but I feel comfortable, you know, nice feels good to know there are few people <laughs> spending their lives on this and trying to figure out how we um, how we deal with it anyway we can all talk about it. we can all talk about that as well as what our duty to future generations are of course if the world ends or the planet ends or the species ends there will be no future generations so we won't have to worry worry about that at all the two more important things, I mean, that, that's important enough because I talk mostly about that, but the more important things John said are ones that I'd like to try to get resolved because I never really figured these out myself. I try to figure out what we're arguing about, okay? Uh, John's first one is that no matter how you change the baby or if you try cloning or some other techniques, uh, that the baby you're going to get is a different baby or that there never would be any baby if you didn't use this technique. Therefore, the baby's not harmed, or at least you have to compare harm to non-existence, and the baby is hardly ever better off not existing. Uh, and here's what I think about that. Uh, I think that's right. I think that the baby is not gonna be able to bring a malpractice suit against the parents. But I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is not what are the baby's harms, but what are the parental obligations? What are the obligations of parents toward their children? And do they have any? And it doesn't matter that the kid can't sue them. What matters is what, what, are, what, are, parents, what are parents for? If you want to go the legal route, you could ask, under what conditions do you think it's reasonable to take custody of the child away from the parents because of their thoughtlessness or their thoughtfulness of the way they brought their child into existence? So there I want to look at, when we look at the child and, and the child who wouldn't have existed, I don't want, I mean, I, we have to talk about that. I'm happy to talk about whether you harmed the child or not. But the more important thing is, did the parents meet their obligations, their parental obligations toward the child? And this comes clearest in John's discussion of, of PGD, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and the uh, selection, the deaf case, okay? Because I heard John say this, and I know he meant it sincerely. He said that we shouldn't take away the rights of parents to select their embryos, even deaf embryos, um, because they're doing it, quote, out of love and concern for the child. Okay. And I, you know, there, John's absolutely right and clear that parental obligations are to love and have concern for the child. Uh, so he, here he takes that, that for granted. But it's neither the parent nor the child that I'm worried about in the case where you have six embryos, three of them are deaf, and three of them are hearing. And the couple wants the deaf ones. I have no problem with the couple wanting the deaf ones. My problem here is with the physician. 
Now, physicians have obligations to their patients. This is not a real person yet, obviously, but it's their patient. It's going to be their future patient, and it's going to be a deaf one. And I don't believe it is professionally responsible, ethical, it's legal probably, uh, for a physician to purposely help produce a child that's going to have one of his major senses missing. That's just got to be antithetical to everything medicine stands for, which is for health and alleviation of suffering. All right, when you're, you know, maybe the child will be fine, but there's no, no physician. There may be one or two physicians who have had a lot of experience with the deaf community, but basically there should be no physicians who think that it's better when you have a choice, because we have healthy embryos, to have a baby who has no hearing rather than a baby that has a hearing. So again, it's not the parents I object to. It's not even the child that's harmed. It's the doctor who's put in a position of doing something that is antithetical to medicine. Okay. And I'll leave with that, and then we can open it up. Uh, yeah, can I just make a quick response sure and then open it, it up? Yes, sir, we can. And, and, uh, what, I think yield my time. Uh, what I think is <laughs> happening is George is folding in the question of harm into parental duty and into doctor yes, choice or duty as well. So we're still back to that issue. There may be other bases for saying that it's wrong to do, but in terms of, uh, of, of uh, at least at first cut, uh, the non-identity problem, it's hard to say that that individual child who will be born, the deaf child, is harmed by this uh, because uh, that, that child is going to be loved and that child is not harmed, even though another child might have been born with a different kind of life. And so to say that a better life, right? Well, a, a better life, <laughs> not better than the child who was born deaf because that child could not otherwise be born. There's no way that that child could have been born and been uh, had its hearing. If so, there may be an obligation on the parents to do that. If that harm is, is, is avoidable to, to, to the child. So uh, anyway, my point is that it gets folded in, and uh, I think you could do that. The doctor has no, no obligation to, to do this, but if the doctor is concerned, again, it's because the doctor is looking at the larger group, the larger, say, cohort of children born, uh, rather than this uh, individual. So, so let me stop there and uh, turn it over to uh, Karen to take questions, and maybe John and Bill can help us out. Yeah. Um, well, thanks to you both, and thanks to adding to the already rich papers that you sent, and, um, and uh, Actually, John started by echoing some of the, I think some of the responses of the students from, so I didn't say this to people who aren't usually here. So these two tables um, right here are filled with students in the seminar. Um, and a lot of the discussion we had about um, one of George's papers last week's which week, week was exactly about the extent to which people were convinced by the problem. Um, but nevertheless, they engaged in it quite a bit. Um, so I want to ask, um, the students get the first chance at two or three questions, and then uh, we'll open it up. And I already saw a couple of uh, hands, so try to get my attention uh, while they're asking the questions. But, uh, yes. Oh, my question's for Professor Ennis. Uh, you can have to talk a little louder. Sorry. Um, reading through your papers, I'm seeing sort of a shift from human altering to human endangering. Yeah. this would change the human race as a whole, and that that was by itself so major a concept that we didn't want to sort of experiment in this area. Um, but a lot of the discussions sort of revolved around individual, um, not, I guess, not irritable uh, characteristics, and I'm curious as to how that factors into it. Yeah, obviously, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, when you deal with individuals, you're never going to be doing species altering, mm -hmm. except in one case, right? I mean, if you clone someone, the first clone would be the first human being with a single genetic parent. So that would be different. <laughs> well, it's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, yeah, I mean, as you just said, 99.5% is the other. I, you know, we can go back to discuss what we mean by a mother. What's a mother? How many mothers do you have? I mean, I think with a surrogate mother, you always have two mothers, the woman who gives birth and the genetic mother. And if you have a mitochondrial 
as well. You could have three mothers, but I don't think just having mitochondrial DNA should qualify you as a mother. Then any genetic contribution you made, you'd be a mother. And if we ever get to the point where we're altering genes, we could have hundreds of mothers. And I don't think that makes any sense. But, but we can talk about that for sure. Too much mothering. Too much mothering. What a great line that is. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, but the problem with saying that they're not uh, related at all is once you do it once, then you're either going to make, then you make a decision almost right away that this is so horrible we're never going to do it again. And that happens, right? We, we make mistakes. Like, like the flu uh, experiment with the ferrets. I mean, I think we actually made a decision. That was crazy, even though at the time it seemed very reasonable to very smart scientists in the United States. Okay, so that, that's, that's a good thing. Or you, make, or you make the decision, gee, this wasn't so bad, like IVF. I mean, when Ed Edwards and Steptoe did IVF, it took them many, many years to get a, get a pregnancy and a live birth. And most, many people, I don't know most, nobody did surveys, but most, many scientists thought you're going to have a severely disabled child. And when Louise Brown was born perfectly normal, people sighed, you know, said, oh, we should do this. Then everybody started doing it, all right? So one of those two things is going to happen if you do individuals. So... I don't think for individuals you have to immediately go to species changing, but I think you should have to recognize that individuals have the potential to change, if not what we do, to change how we think. And Louise Brown really did. It, it changed the, the way we thought about, about pregnancy and about who could have a baby and who couldn't have a baby. And I think in that case for good, but, but nonetheless, we have, you know, no, it didn't affect every individual, but it affected the view that most people on the planet had of pregnancy. Mm. Uh, Laura. Um, my question is uh, also about. Uh, yeah, if you could yell a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, my question is also about um, your discussion of species endangering. Yeah. And um, you mentioned that there's some studies that have shown that there's some genetic variation that can lead to That is such a good question. The question is, where do I draw the line between species altering and species endangering? Uh, there's no magic line. I would like to say there's a magic line and that this is a whole regulatory scheme. It's not. It's, it's, in, uh, uh, it's in the first uh, approximation of a regulatory scheme, right? But so, so now it's functional. Uh, things that have the potential to be species endangering, to actually endanger the whole species, are in that category. Things that don't seem to, you know, we think really don't have that, that possibility. An example I gave, and I, you know, let me, let's think about whether that's a good example or not, I'm not saying I is let's suppose we decided that uh, the only way we can solve racism is to make this everybody's skin color blue, okay? That would be a species alteration, but I don't think although I could be persuaded I'm wrong, that that would be species endangering, even though it would have a radical impact on the species. Okay. But I think it would be a good thing. It could be a good thing, <laughs> depending on how we dealt with it. Right? I think that George knows this very well, that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, has already uh, asserted control over manipulation of, of uh, gametes outside of the body and uh, creating embryos all the So it already has jurisdiction there. And, uh, so the first level, you have to deal with that in the U.S. to go forward. Uh, the, the, the big issue now is uh, that has come up is uh, women who have a have a mitochondrial defect uh, there. There's something like that. The mi mitochondrial DNA are little uh, little pieces of DNA that provide energy for the cell that are outside of the nucleus. That women have a defect there. The children have some very serious diseases. Uh, they're otherwise fertile, so. 
the, the question now is of getting uh, a, a cytoplasm from a woman without that uh, mitochondrial defect. So the technique, and Drew refers to this in his chapter, is uh, you would create uh, an embryo with the husband and wife's uh, gametes. You would take uh, the nucleus of that embryo out, and you would put it in the, uh, in the egg of a donor who has normal mitochondrial DNA, uh, in the egg of a donor uh, there, uh, whose, uh, from whose cell uh, the nucleus has been removed. So it wouldn't be cloning. It would just be taking the nucleus of the couple at risk and putting it into uh, an egg that would then allow uh, the child to be born that have 99.5 whatever percent of the, the <coughs> genome of the, the, the couple, but have some additional uh, genetic material. And this has caused great consternation at the FDA. It's the first instance of a germline alteration, uh, which is a major change uh, here, uh, the first step, and so uh, it's leading them to uh, not approve it at the present time. It has been approved to go forward in, in, the, in the UK at Newcastle where they have a different system going there, and so, so that would be an example where there's some rules now. George, do you? Um, what about that? You'd be in favor of doing that if you could show the same. Right? <laughs> I mean, the answer is just barely. The question is, how far do we want to go so couples can use their own genes in reproduction? How important is the gene? Right. Most of the assisted reproduction te technologies are all about uh, the man having a genetic child. Who, do we really care? I guess we do care. I mean, some people care. There's a market for that, for sure. But for this one, it's easy. We just use donor egg. Why use the woman's own egg? You know? Yeah, people want to have their genetic child, but that's because, not you, but that's because physicians and tell them they can have their own genetic child. You know, all of a sudden, you know, adoption is marginalized, uh, using, uh, you know, donor egg is marginalized. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure we have to jump. Everything has a technological solution. That's, a diff that's different from the other things we're talking about, but uh, I... Yeah, the, the major issue this is not a big thing. Mitochondrial DNA diseases are terrible, but they're not a, numerically a very big thing. And once you have one, you can never have another one as long as you use donor egg. And what, what we run up against here is the cultural significance of the, the bloodline. You know, that That's true. It's a matter to a lot of people. It defines the identity and important place for people. Maybe not so much socially, but it comes to do that. It's just one of the why not use donor eggs? It's a big challenge in this area, right? Big yeah. but, and, and, and so people talk about, well, this is a child that will have three mothers. It will have a mitochondrial mother. Uh, it's just ridiculous. A, 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 a nuclear DNA mother. Uh, it will have a gestational mother. Uh, and it will have a rearing mother who may be different from all those. That could so be. Um, too, much, too much mothering. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Um, so, so I, before opening it up more broadly, I just wanted to ask a question, which is, um, it seems to me that you all are very nicely and respectfully debating issues that you've been debating for a while. And I'm wondering to what extent... And not solve it. And, 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 and so I'm wondering, George, to what extent your concerns about species endangerment are really what's driving your argument. Uh, not what's driving the genetics. I mean, there's a whole different chapter in the book about genetics, about all this, about reproduction, reproductive genetics. So that's just one small part of the species endangering argument. Okay, yeah. But it just seems to me that a lot of this debate, I mean, you all are having it without the species endangerment, even though what got us into it was your argument about it. So if you were well, no, I mean, it wasn't a fear, you'd still have a draw line, you would draw presumably. Yeah, no, I draw, draw the cloning line. I think the cloning line was the right line to draw, and I'd, I'd stick with that one. Yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. Um, okay. Bill Sage, do you still have your question? Yeah, I have more questions <laughs> now having oh. listened to this. So, so I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sold on what the species endangerment arguments are. I'm with John that none of the things that are being talked about strike me as scalable. And then I'm even more convinced that if there's one thing we've done over the last several thousand years is we 
altered our species already, and I'm not sure why any of the things that we're talking about here are you know, uh, categorically different. But I'm actually just, I'm interested in whether there are any lines that anyone wants to draw on principles rather than pragmatic grounds, because it seems to me that every time you guys talk about any example, you keep shifting the terrain. Either we're talking about species alteration or we're talking about the germ line. And then, George, you kind of switched us over to the definition of harm and what's consistent with the medical profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the question I'll formulate is, OK, if I take away the species and the germ line and talk about something we don't talk about all that much, or at least I don't read about much these days, which is just non-germ line alteration, um, are you, wh where do you stand on a hearing individual who decides that she wants to be rendered non-hearing in order to take advantage of all of the great cultural opportunities that would then become available to her? Yeah. Well, I, where I stand, it's pretty easy. I don't think doctors could do that. If they, she wants to put chopsticks through her ears, that's, you know, who's going to stop her? But uh, no, I don't think physicians can uh, take away a, a major sense <laughs> from a person, even if that's what they want. I just think that is outside the realm of medical ethics and medical practice. And more importantly, parents do not have the right to take a hearing child and make it non-hearing. That would be a crime. Now, we would call that child abuse, I think, in any state in the United States. And the parents should go to jail for doing that, even though they believe sincerely that this is good for their child. This is not good for their child. I, I agree with you. Oh, OK. If the child's already born. And you got to do it as a fetus? Well, I'm throwing it there in the sense of harm to, to the individual. Okay? That there's an individual who's already born, who has interests and rights, a hearing individual, and now the parents at any age after birth want to deprive it of hearing. That sounds like child abuse. Child abuse. Let's do what it's in the law school. <laughs> That's child abuse. Okay, so, so you all have uh, provoked a number of hands to go okay. up. Um, and so I'm now going to institute the one finger, two finger rule, which is does anyone have anything they'd like to say on the points that are on the table? Uh, I see a half a hand. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have a question like, assuming that it is okay um, for like the hearing example, like to do it with the fetus. Where does, where's like the line drawn, like the hearing with sight, with like missing a kidney, like you know what I'm saying, like where is the line drawn, like these parents don't have arms and they feel like their life is different culturally, like should we have allowed this child to not have arms because their parents don't have arms and they want to have that cultural experience, like where's the line drawn with that? That's to John. <laughs> uh, yeah, well. There, there may be different considerations there, I mean, it, uh, but if you ask, is that individual harmed who would not otherwise be born, and if it's life without arms, as horrible as that seems, is otherwise a, a life of uh, uh, meaning and flourishing to it from its own perspective, it's not so horrible a life that uh, it, should be, uh, it would want to be killed. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, you'd have to find some other basis for that. You certainly wouldn't want to encourage that. Uh, you might have to come up with other arguments there, but there'd the be a non harm basis. Non and maybe John D can help us with this. Uh, <laughs> Thanks a lot. This, this is known as punting. Okay, He's no, been trying to get it for a while. Let's get some. Uh, look, look, John's, John's point is that uh, to call something a harm, this is not right. You have to make the person worse off. Right. And you're not making the person worse off if they didn't, if they wouldn't have existed in the first place, unless you're so uh, <laughs> ruining their lives that they're just going to have a, a, a life not worth living. So it's a certain view of what a harm is. Right. I don't think you have the same view of harm I don't. as John. And that's where the, that's where the problem is. Not the only, but I think. No, <laughs> okay, no, I think you're right. Well, well I, I, you're, I, you're talking about social harm. Or, no. I just think even in the DC, uh, yeah. Professor Anna sees harm uh, as uh, not will the person be made worse off, but rather will the person be deprived of some, some 
good. Absolutely. Which uh, we we think uh, will is uh, part of human life. Or something like that. That's fair. That's, even if it has no other alternative way to exist. Well, it has well, no it alternative was, because of what you did. Yes. But you do believe parents have some obligations to their children, or not? Of course. Okay. All right. But if, and, and if so, but if they had, you know, they got two different children, one with arms, they could have one with arms, and one without arms. It seems to me they have an obligation to choose with arms. It seems to me. Well, certainly after the child is born. No, no, before it's an embryo at the embryo at the PGD level. That's what the is about. I know that's what the debate is. <laughs> I have to come up with some other view of harm, and maybe it's. I mean, it's not a setback to interest. It's. I really think you can't just look at this as embryos. You got to look at this as families. This is part of a family. It's not just an embryo. It's right. an embryo in a family right. context. In terms no, of, I don't have anything you want to go there. Okay. You know? Because, okay. Because families because are, the, might get the, the deaf family. Is that what you're saying? Parents are deaf. Okay. All right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, did you want to add in on? Well, I'll, I'll stick with obligations. <laughs> I was just going to ask about the idea that not being born is a bad thing. I mean, oh, that's a great question. Since you but never know about nobody it. to talk about. There's no individual <laughs> who exists to talk about having any interests if they haven't been born. No one who's never been born can, can be harmed. Right. So, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's almost like it would be better to be born with this, that, or the other problem than not to be born at all. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I would agree with that. From the perspective... <laughs> of that individual who was born, now that they are here in the world, uh, from their perspective, and, and of course, if they think that it is so bad that they have been they born, they can kill themselves. They yeah. would have been better off not to have been born and let them choose active euthanasia. They're babies. Son, they can't, they can't choose. <laughs> they gotta, they gotta <laughs> suffer through 18. <laughs> Okay. Okay, um, Sam. Uh, so just two quick things. Um, you know, I may I may be misinformed, but it's my understanding that there are billions of people who have a cosmology that it's better to not be born. It's, it's better to be free from birth, right? I think that there's a actually a wide range of of views, possible views on that topic. I just had a question, a point of information question about a topic that seems related to reproductive sexuality, but maybe isn't so tightly tied to it, with George Annis. I'm really curious, hearing all this, about what your positions might be on the outline or discouraging of circumcision, female-male circumcision, right? Recently, male circumcision was briefly almost outlawed in one country in Europe. Female circumcision, of course, is a, you know, considered a major uh, public health issue. Where, where do you stand on circumcision? On uh, female circumcision, which we like to call female genital mutilation. <laughs> I'm against it, uh, obviously. Um, I'm not a big fan of circumcision either, but I wouldn't yes. outlaw it because it has such a religious connotation. With it, you know? And it doesn't seem to be harmful, but if you had good medical evidence that it was actually a harm to the child. I mean, it's tough to operate on a child, for a, do an unnecessary operation on a child. So I'm, I've, I'm pretty close on that, but there's no, I see no justification for female genital mutilation. That's, you know harming a child who can't consent. Um, yes. Well, I just had a question about like new technologies and IVF, such as the uh, mitochondrial procedures and other uh, progress that might be made in the future. Not so much about uh, wiping out the human race, but like let's say in a less intense case, just uh, would there be a social stigma or social unacceptability uh, created by the divide between people who <laughs> Yeah, no, that's exactly to summarize the, article, the argument exactly. It would not be ethical if there's a high, if there's any reasonable possibility that it's going to end in one group killing the other group. Yeah, right. 
That's highly speculative. Or even marking them as different, if you're playing out without getting into the larger species. Right. That, that someone who's had an alteration to enable them to live healthy in the first place, that, that would somehow mark them, uh, not a mark of Cain, but a, a mark of... Margaret Mark Atwood. Uh, Mark Atwood. Mark, Mark <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that kind of mark would arise from that alteration. Uh, I mean, many people who argue against my categorization say that we have so many ways we discriminate against each other now, adding one more is not a big deal. <laughs> I don't know if I buy that. But I can understand that's kind of John's point that aren't I picking out a, a non problem, or at least a marginal problem? when we have so many other ways people are literally dying in this world every day. And I, you know, it's not the only problem that we're got, so I can see that, that that's a legitimate critique. Michelle, you still. Uh, yeah, my, my point would go back to some of what we already discussed. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, it seems to me that with the boundaries drawn on what it, what it is considered to be a perfect like human being or not, so like it seems to me that you guys go back to the fact that well, no arms or no hearing wouldn't be as perfect, so that it wouldn't be allowed. But if you would be able to experiment in embryos, if it would be to make somebody perfect or to make it a better human, so it, it seems to me like it's a long, uh, it's a line that is not drawn really well because well, who will define what is a perfect human? And you said that. I didn't say that. I hope. No, no, no. Like I mean, you said like. You I know, said you can experiment. Perfect yeah, you can certainly do right. disease alterations. I think if there's no other way to to stop a kid from having Tay Sachs disease, for example. Yeah. So like, well, again. So but I, you but I did say decide. once you start there, you go to. Yeah. yeah you were kind of deciding what would be okay or not, and how would you. No, that's right. Oh, you're right. Absolutely, and this is why there's been this uproar, mini uproar at least, against the mitochondrial DNA experiments. It's not that that experiment itself is so horrible, it's that it crosses this boundary to germline genetics, and people are worried about what goes in that. Once you don't have that boundary, even though everybody knows it's kind of an artificial boundary, but once you cross it, they're afraid anything goes. Then we can alter the embryo to, to make it better. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right, because we've already done germline genetic engineering. We've crossed that boundary. So, so George, could I ask you a question? Or would that be out of order? Before? We'll get the kids first, but. Yeah. Uh, get the kids. <laughs> Sorry to call you kids, but yeah. Uh -huh. I, at my age, I can call you kids. No, I'm <laughs> young men so, so Tina. <laughs> Absolutely. No, the haves and the have-nots, and yeah, yeah, the, the rich and the upper middle class will be the only ones who have access to a lot of these technologies, that's right. And so they may be the only ones that are going to have genetically related babies, right, because they can afford the IVF but, you know, all around the world, their clinics, yeah. So of course you're concerned about that, yeah. And John might even say I should be much more concerned about uh, income inequality than about <laughs> any kind of genetic change altering inequality. And we should be. We should all be. I mean, uh, IVF and the new genetics is almost entirely based on private medicine. Right? It's not covered by a lot of insurance policies. It was the only thing that wasn't covered by the Clinton health care plan. The only thing. You know, uh, so it's times, covered in Massachusetts. It is. States, states have laws. And uh, uh, in another life, I was on the board of directors of Resolve, which is the major uh, parental organization to push for IVF, uh, and 
And I, you know, I, I'm not against IVF by any means. And if you're going to have it, it should certainly be available to everybody. Yes, I totally agree with that. Because otherwise, it's very unfair and it perpetuates yeah, inequalities. You're absolutely right. That is such a great hypothetical. I was wondering, though, who gets to decide what is a harmful quality for a human to have, and I think that would be sort of her same question. And, you know, you talk about parents having duties, but I also think that parents have privileges to choose certain things for their children. And if, and if we decide that parents can't make decisions regarding having disabilities or abilities, but could, if they had the ability to stop their child from having a disease, That's a hard question, right? I mean, uh, my colleague, Sherman Elias, who was a co-author of that, we tried to make a list of, you know, of what we call serious genetic problems, which would justify, uh, just, we don't have to justify abortion, but which would be, which a doctor would have an obligation to tell women about and, and counsel them about it. It turned out to be impossible. We just couldn't do it. We couldn't figure out the right, and no one's been able to do that list, because it's really, really hard. You know, what's a serious genetic condition? Uh, the closest we came, and this is true, uh, after years of being this, is this, all this stuff started with Down syndrome. The first genetic test was to find trisomy 21, all right? And since then, I actually believe this is true descriptively, uh, and maybe uh, normatively too, is the question doctors ask, is this worse, this new condition that we found, is this worse than Down syndrome? Then we're gonna screen for it and, and counsel people that you know, abortion is appropriate. Uh, or is this not as bad as Down syndrome? In which case, more more nuanced discussion. But you do think parents should be able to decide if they parents have certainly to have a child with Down syndrome? Uh, yeah, I think parents should be able to decide that. Absolutely, I think parents should be able to take advantage of of embryo screening and take advantage of fetal screening. Yes, and trust me, that's very controversial. <laughs> No, I'm totally for, I mean, I go with John on almost everything, <laughs> reproductive freedom, until we get to, you know, redesigning kids. Yeah. Sorry, I find it interesting and intriguing that um, you comment that the kid that's deaf wouldn't be, like, positive for the kid to be born. So, like, um, actually, now you're saying that uh, the kid that has Down syndrome maybe should not be born. The fetus, the right. fetus that has Down yeah. syndrome. Once a kid's born, it has all the rights and of everybody else. Okay, but then the deaf uh, kid should not be born. Should have, the parents should have the right to have the kid that is a hearing kid. If the parents have a choice between a hearing kid and a non-hearing kid on PGD, that was the, you know, the embryos. That was the choice. Yes, I think that. Well, I don't the parents can make the decision, but I don't think the doctor can fulfill that wish of the parents. I think the doctor has to pick the hearing kids. Because right? oh, okay. I don't think the pra medical practitioners dedicate, I hope, to health and, and life can affirmatively help someone have a child without one of the major it's senses. A, it's a very rich deaf culture. Yeah. And they, and they want to have their child. Of course, they want to have it. Yeah, but uh, it just desire and money is not enough. I don't. I think don't think you can do that to kids. And my, that's you know, it's my my view, and I don't think. I mean, I don't think we found a doctor who's willing to publicly say they'd do that either. I mean, that really does go against heavy-duty medical ethics. They're willing to discriminate against a whole culture that has a set of values about the No, I'm just willing to say that they don't get to impose their values on the rest of the culture by, having, by making us harm children in a way that perpetuates no, they're, 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 they're I know they're not... Patient genetic diagnosis. They, they rule out the Huntingtons that no. they, they want to have the death child. Oh, once they have, once they're pregnant, that's a different issue. We're not going to, we're not going to get involved in abortion. I'm not going to get involved. Yeah. This. Yeah. <laughs> find a deaf physician. That's a very smart. <laughs> that, would, that would solve your uh, pragmatic uh, decision. Okay. All right. So we have time for um, maybe two more questions. So I would suggest that we take 
you, and then we let John ask the last question. I, know, I don't need to ask. You don't want your question? I've already answered, right? <laughs> okay, well, then we really have only time for one question. So, okay. yes. So back to your point about drawing the line at Down syndrome, what about genetic conditions that have different levels of severity? Yeah, yeah like most of them. Most of them. Down syndrome does, too. You know, we always hear people, that's a, this is a good Down and this is a bad So what if someone has, like, Down syndrome, but it's so slight? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Basically Problem is you can't predict that yet, but we're working. I'm actually working with a guy a little bit uh, at, at Mass General Hospital in, in Boston who's trying to find a cure for Down syndrome, trying to have treatments for Down syndrome. Now, that, I give him all the credit for that because he's one of the first people I know, serious scientists, who actually is trying to treat that. And that's absolutely right. That's the right thing to do. You know, we should be finding a treatment. When Sherman and I, Dr. Lyles and I, first wrote together, book called Reproductive Genetics and the Law back you know, about 30 years ago uh, when we talked about Down syndrome in there. We actually thought that we, there'd be a cure for it by now. Way too optimistic, but, but they are at least looking for one now. Alejandro? Alejandro you, wants the last yeah, question. You get it, you get it, all right. Maybe we're too impatient. Ah. So, you know, evolution takes a long time, and during that evolutionary period, there's uh, genetic genetic mutations that are bad, mm -hmm. and that's the end of the road. But sometimes genetic mutations that are bad, there's on top a new mutation that makes a strength. So we're looking at the treatment of just an individual. We don't know if a Down syndrome mutation will perhaps remutate in the same spot and become something that it will be perceived as, as a strength instead of a disease. We don't. You're absolutely right. We think we know a lot more than we know. And we also live, you know, I think there's been, genetics is like 50 years old, maybe even less than that in terms of clinical genetics. That's a nothing in the history of human species. You're absolutely right about that. So that's why when we think about the future, we're really speculating, right? I mean, before we sequence the genome, the most heavy duty geneticists in the United States were having wages on how many genes there were. And the average was 100,000. Everybody thought there were at least 100,000 genes. You know, there were 22,000. I mean, how can you be that far off? I asked Eric Landers that. And he said, well, how can you? Because they're all different lengths, and you don't know how many the average is. But, but anyway, no, what we don't know is incredible. Absolutely. I agree. Well, thank you so much for. Thank you.